as stated, we thank God for this morning and for all of the many wonderful and outstanding blessings that he has given to us. None of which we deserve, but all of which we need to survive and to be useful in God's work upon the earth as we prepare for the day when human history comes to an end and we are called from the region of the dead to stand before God in judgment to give an account for all the things that we have done for our thoughts, for our attitudes and for every aspect of life on the face of God's earth. I thank God for a good meeting in Kentucky. No one was immersed into Christ, but the seed was sown. There were uh, many people who came from the area and from some areas that were quite a distance away from Eubank, Kentucky. And we pray that the word of the living God will always flourish and have its course in the uh, affairs of human beings and that God's will will be accomplished in God's way. I appreciate those who continue teaching, preaching, encouraging, defending, and standing for and within the pathway of righteousness. And may God continue to bless our men here, our young people, and our sisters who work and who work diligently behind the scenes and often in circumstances that are not easy to deal with. But nevertheless, they are working and glorifying God and trying to encourage those around them to make their stand for the will of the Lord. And may God bless all who work to the best of their ability, even though sometimes that work may go unnoticed by those who are not aware of the good that is being done. The lesson this morning is requested, actually just within the last couple of weeks. I often make the point that if there's something that someone wants to hear God's perspective on it and to look at what God's Word teaches about it, let me know. Give me the topic, give me the subject, give me the Word, whatever it is that you want to have analyzed based upon the sacred writings, and I will try to accommodate. And so it is in this case. Our lesson's title is Making Laws That God Did Not Make. And I have five areas that I would like to cover in this morning's lesson, and they will be the following. I will define what is meant by the word lawgiver in James 4.12. Secondly, I will ask and answer the question, what motivates people to make laws that God did not make? Third, I will give several examples of laws that have been made by humans that God did not make. I will then consider the dangers involved in making laws for God. And then fifth and finally, I will discuss ways to avoid making laws that God did not make. It is my conviction that the lesson is extremely important, that it is relevant, and that we can derive good from that which is spoken, if what is spoken is what God's Word teaches ought to be spoken. So number one, in James 4, <clears throat> in verses 11 and 12, we read the following. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, I just read this from the NIV, the 2011 edition. And there is a very important point that James makes in this reading. And in order to make this point the way that it will stick, I want to make just a brief appeal to God's New Testament that he gave his word in in the first century. And this is not going to be a course on Greek. 
but it will be a reference to it because there is something that is here in the Greek New Testament that is not brought out by most translations. As close as I have been able to find among English translations that emphasizes the point that I'm going to make momentarily is the old American Standard Version of 1901. And the reason that most English translations do not have the word order that I'm about to mention is because it's awkward to English readers and English listeners because Greek and English don't operate on the same uh, grammatical principles nor do Hebrew, Aramaic and English. Languages differ. The means by which they approach things differ. And that's why that in the process of translation from Hebrew and Aramaic to English or from Greek to English, something has to be given up if it's to be understandable. It's simply unavoidable. But nevertheless, in James 4 and verse 12, in the Greek text, it is not stated, as the NIV 211 has it, there is only one lawgiver and the ESV and others. What is said is like this. One is lawgiver and judge. That's what it says. The word one is haste. Here it's used numerically. What James says is, one is lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. Now what that does is, since the word one appears first in the sentence, that immediately notifies the translator that it is used emphatically. That it is put first in the sentence for emphasis sake. And so it is. So James is seeking to point out that there is that one and no more. That one in singular terms is the lawgiver and judge. Not mortals, not preachers, not teachers, not husbands, not wives, not mothers, not fathers, not sons, not daughters, not professors, not editors, not brotherhood journals. One is lawgiver and judge. And then he identifies the one. Who is it? The one who is able to save and destroy. Now let's look at the word lawgiver. What does James mean by the use of this word that we see in English as lawgiver? The word means a legislator. It means one who makes a law. One who decides on a system of law. So what James says is, one is lawmaker. One is legislator. One has the right to make laws or a system of law. And by saying that one is lawmaker, one is legislator, one is the person who decides on a system that takes it out of our hands to do it. That removes it from Daly's hands. That removes it from Maxwell's hands. That removes spiritual lawmaking from Bowie's hands. That removes spiritual lawmaking from Jared's hands. That puts it and keeps it in the hands of the only one who is legislator or lawmaker, and that is God. <coughs> now this shows the seriousness of making laws that God didn't make. Because if, if one is lawmaker, if one is legislator, then when I go about making laws that the real legislator and lawmaker didn't make, then I'm flying right in his face. That's dangerous. No one should ever want to do that. Not even the apostles could make laws that God didn't make. Some people have a severe misunderstanding of the apostolic office. They really do not get what the apostles' role was. The apostles were not 
human legislators who were making laws for God and then God would say, hmm, that sounds like a good law. I think I will accept it. Not the way it works. Matthew 16 and verse 19, Jesus told the apostles, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. It's not that the apostles would declare something to be law and then God would later ratify it and accept it. No, what he's saying is whatever you as my spokespersons, whatever you as my apostles, whatever you as my ambassadors, whatever you as my representatives declare God's law to be is what God has already decided on. Now we'll move to the second segment of the lesson. What motivates people to make laws for God? I have at least four things that do this motivating. Number one, pride. When people are swollen up with themselves or when they are in a, a prideful condition or state, they'll make laws for anybody and then seek to impose those laws on everybody around them. Perfect case of pride, Herod, uh, not Herod, but Pharaoh, and then Herod in Acts 12. Pharaoh, Acts, uh, Exodus 5, verse 2. Yahweh sent Moses back to the land of Egypt. He said, go back. Go back and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, that they may come out into the wilderness and serve me. They returned to Pharaoh, declared what Yahweh had stated, and Pharaoh says in Exodus 5, 2, Who is Yahweh that I should listen to him? I don't know Yahweh, and I will not let the people go. That's pride. That's called being swollen with your own conceit. That's an instance in which a ruler's chest was so overblown with pride and haughtiness and arrogance that had he fallen, he would have burst wide open. Pharaoh represents pride, but so does Herod, Acts 12. Herod stood before the people one day to deliver a speech or an oration, and the people said, Oh, the voice of a God, not a man, not a mortal. And God's word says, Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck Pharaoh and he was eaten by worms because he did not give God the glory. Pride. Pride causes people to make laws God didn't make. Secondly, ignorance. There are people who no more do not know any more about God's word than they do how to fly on an ice cube to the sun. Amen. That's exactly right. Boy, wouldn't that be some journey? <laughs> ice cube to the sun. From cold to exceedingly hot. But nevertheless, ignorance. You don't, you can't act on what you don't know. 2 Peter 3, verse 16, Peter says that Paul wrote some difficult things in his letters. Speaking about matters regarding judgment, the end of time, etc. He says his letters contain some things that are hard to be understood, which the ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Let us remember that ignorance is not a virtue. Ignorance is not praiseworthy. Ignorance is inexcusable, especially when we can study God's word, put it in the mind, look at the context, define the words, Ask others who know what text and words and concepts and phrases mean. Yes, there are those who make laws God didn't make because they are uninformed. They don't know any better. But sometimes people don't know any better because of their own unwillingness to learn. 
but whether it is deliberately unwilling or whether a person simply is not in the know due to the process of growth, making laws for God is inexcusable. Never right to do that. Another thing that causes people to make laws God didn't make is tradition. Congregations and individuals start doing things and they do them so long until in their own mind they actually become law to them. They actually think, we've done it this way, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, one year, any other way would be wrong. <coughs> the question is, where does the Bible say that? Where does God's Word teach that? Variation does not always mean something's wrong. Most congregations, just when they have the assembly convened in order to worship, two songs, prayer, another song, lesson. Well, actually, you can have it one song, no prayer, lesson, after the lesson, two songs, prayer, etc. And the reason is, the Bible does not give us an order of worship in the sense of where each act is to fall in place. It simply doesn't. We look at the New Testament, we're not told how many songs they sang. We're not told when they sang them. We're not told at what point they offered the Lord's Supper. What we are told is when they offered the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We're told what they did when they came together. They sang, they prayed, they taught, they ate the Lord's Supper, and they gave. Remember what we're talking about this morning, making laws that God didn't make. Matthew 15, 4 and following, the Lord confronted those of the Jewish leaders of his day because they were ridiculing and condemning the Lord and his disciples because they did not follow the tradition of the elders. Matthew 15, some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. They were more concerned with the Lord and his disciples breaking the tradition of the elders than they were about anyone breaking the command of God. Think about it more concerned for their tradition than they were the Word of God. There are people just like that today. They won't defend the Word of God in any cause because they think it is mean-spirited, unkind, not loving, but boy, they will defend their traditions. <laughs> They'll rip your goozle out, smack your top of your head off, and run blood through your eyes in defense of their tradition when they wouldn't lift a finger to defend the will and law of the God of glory. There's a dead cat on the line somewhere. And then the Lord says to them in verse 3, And why do you, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Listen to what the Lord is asking them. Why do you break God's command for the sake of your tradition? In other words, he's asking them, Why do you consider your tradition more important than the will of God? You set aside the will of God, but you keep your tradition. Most people don't want their traditions tampered with. <laughs> Mess with anything else, but not their tradition. No, sir. We're going to talk about that in just a minute because I'm going to give specific examples of it. Another thing that motivates people to make laws for God is peer pressure. You'd be surprised how many people will hear something that they know is not right but they won't speak out and won't say a thing. They want the preacher to say it. They want the preacher to do the correcting. They want the preacher to do the exposition of the text. And preachers should. But we're not the only ones. I, I've never understood how a person can know something is wrong. Whether it's wrong in deed or in speech, and say nothing. They say that they are not afraid to own up that they follow Jesus. But when the time comes to make that stand for Jesus, they're just like Peter. I don't know him. 
What are you talking about? Oh, did I say that? Peer pressure. Peter had this problem. Galatians, the second chapter. It is Paul who wrote the letter to the Galatians. And in this letter to the Galatians that he sent to them, Paul mentioned Peter. Sure did. Verse 11, he said, When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to the face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid. Peer pressure got to Peter. He was fine with the Gentiles, eating with the Gentiles. But when other Jews came in, Peter shrank back like a tail dragon dog. That's right. As long as nobody was around to condemn or critique Peter, he was fine with the Gentiles. When the Jews came in, Paul says Peter shrank. He drew back from the Gentiles, separated himself from the Gentiles. And you know what Paul said he did? Paul said that he opposed Peter to the face. You see, Paul was not politically correct. He didn't have this mentality. Well, I know he's wrong, but I don't want to start a fight. Paul believed serving God necessitated taking a stand at times when it was not popular to do so. Peer pressure. But it's interesting what he says in verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. You know what Paul is saying? Peter, you're a Jew, but you're happy with these Gentiles. Great! But why is it that you force them to keep Jewish customs when Jewish brothers approach and come? Peer pressure. Now, I want to consider some examples of making laws that God did not make. There is the prevailing opinion in some congregations that men must not be allowed to participate in public service unless they have a suit on or at least a shirt and tie. I know some congregations who say that, who believe that. I know some people who say that and who believe that. The question is, where does God say it? The question is, where does the book say it? Oh, I, there's no doubt that a person who wears a suit and tie might look good. You know, a man well-groomed suit and tie, eye candy to certain people. Not to other men, but to certain people. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure. Put a suit on him, tie on him, shine his shoes, give him a good pair of calf high, see through socks. Great! That's the man. Those are the men that we want to wait at the Lord's table and to serve the congregation on Sunday morning. The problem is. When we mandate that, we're making a law God didn't make. Nowhere in the New Testament, anywhere, does God stipulate the kind of attire that a man must have on in order to wait at the table or to serve the congregation. Here is the guiding principle. Be modest. In other words, a man shouldn't come up with shorts on all the way up around his thighs and so tight he, they hold up his thighs. <laughs> I've seen it. Not here. And then he wears a shirt that's more like a so-called muscle shirt. Couldn't you just see me in one of those <laughs> with my big biceps? <laughs> yeah. Somebody said, it's the bi, but the seps ain't never been there. <laughs> But you get my point. 
The guiding principle is modesty. Nowhere does God's word teach or even hint at the fact that in order to publicly serve God, that a man must wear a suit, that a man must have a tie, that a man must have this polished look about himself. Well, I know the usual objection to it, but Brother Daly, we should wear and give God the best we've got. I've never heard anybody deny that. But the best does not mean suit, tie, white shirt, etc. If it does, put your finger on the passage. We're talking about making laws God didn't make. In the apostolic age, at least some, perhaps many, but at least some or several in congregations were slaves. Onesimus was one. Read the letter of Paul to Philemon. And being slaves, they engaged in labor, strenuous labor, because often they sold themselves in order to make provisions for self and family. It is not conceivable that they wore what we know in modern American society as a suit, tie, etc. When we start to look more at what a person has, accepting the principle of, more, of, uh, of, of morality and the principle of decency, then we are looking at something that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Making laws that God did not make. If a person's personal preference is to wear a suit and tie, here is my advice. Wear your suit and tie and don't come without it. If that's your personal preference, whenever you come, have on a suit, have on a tie, have on spit sock shine shoes, have on those over the calf, see through socks, if that's your preference. But you better not bind that on somebody else. If you do, your hand's going to be called. If I do, my hand needs to be called. Because nobody has a right to make laws God didn't make. James 4.12, one is lawgiver. The one who is able to save and destroy. One is lawgiver and judge. Another instance. I've known congregations that said any public reading must be from the King James Version. I've mentioned this a couple of times before. They don't request that people read the King James. There was at least one that made it mandatory because I received their bulletin. And they would have on the masthead, KJV is required reading. And I would say a sizable portion of them did not even understand it. Because it speaks in English that is 400 plus years old. I don't understand why. In the newer song books, and let me just get right to the point about this again in a kind way. I don't understand why publishers of songs continue using old English when most of the young don't even know what they're talking about. Songs are to be, as I said in three of our bulletins, doctrinally correct, and they're to be understandable. Otherwise, how can you know, how can you sing to God in spirit when you don't understand the words of the song? Somebody tell me that. <laughs> tell me, how can we understand what we are singing when we use the old English forms that we don't speak anymore today? I'm serious about this. This gets me. And I know that there's some traditionalists. Well, these are thy and thy. Those are Bible words. No, they're not. Those were the way they talked in 1611 during the Shakespearean era. That has nothing to do with understandability in the 21st century. Now, this is something personal with me. <laughs> if we want people to understand us, we have to speak a language they know. Oh, but Brother Ron, when we use the old English forms, it makes it so much more holy. Does not. I wrote a book on 
translation, translating the scriptures, have spent a sizable portion of my life doing that, though I rarely ever talk about it. Because I'm nothing but a human being forgiven by the grace of God. And I know how people are. Sometimes they begin to resent or think you're tooting a horn. I don't even own a horn. I'm serious. <laughs> but I know one thing. Old English forms are not more sacred than modern forms. Let me prove it. People think that thy, thine, thou, thee, that it's just so spiritual. Well, when the Lord said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Was he showing respect to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. <coughs> when the Lord spoke to the devil in the wilderness in Mark 1, Matthew 4, and told him, get thee, hence Satan. Was he speaking spiritual to the devil when according to the King James he told him, get thee, hence No, that's just the way the King James translators put it. Shows how tradition impacts people. They don't want to see the real side of it. Now, making laws God didn't make. Now, where does God say the King James Version is the only translation that should be used? Not even the King James Version says that. Have you ever looked at the King James Version to see where the King James Version said it's the only version that should be used? Matter of fact, in the preface of the King James Version, the King James Version translators admit that their work was imperfect. Read it. That's right, my sister. They sure do. Read the preface to the KJV if you use one. The King James Version translators themselves admit our work is imperfect. Why? Because they were men. They were not guided by the Holy Spirit like the apostles were, and they knew that. Therefore, being people not guided by the Spirit as the apostles were, they understood that they were going to make translation errors along the way. Another effort at making laws that God didn't make when you hear people say that we cannot use the building to feed needy believers. Do we know what the building is? Do we know what a, this building is? This building is an expedient. This building is built to accommodate the work of a local congregation. Any legitimate work that God has assigned to a, the, a local congregation may be done in the building owned or rented by that local congregation. I'll defend that till the day of judgment because it's authorized by the word of God. It's so sad when people start making laws governing a building that God never made about an expedient. Sometimes people say, well, the building is built for us to come and meet. All right? Guess what? That's true. But is that the only reason it was built? If so, we need to get out restrooms, water fountains. Because you can come and meet and not drink. You can come and meet and not use the restroom. Well, somebody might say, okay, but wait a minute now. There are city ordinances that necessitate places where the public gathers. They must have certain facilities. We're talking about God's will. We're talking about making laws God didn't make. We're talking about the fact that some see the building as having been built as only a place to meet. That's my point. So if it's only as a place to meet, if meeting is not the intent, you can't do it in the building according to their opinion. But the problem is that opinion is wrong. The building was built to accommodate the congregation in its work and mission. One of its works being to gather and worship, to come together and worship. Well, so I can hear somebody say, but in 1 Corinthians 11, 22, Paul said, 
Do you not have houses to eat and to drink in? Do you despise the church of God and put those to shame who have nothing? Do we not know that the word church in English there, ecclesia, means congregation, assembly, a group? Paul is not making a law there regarding the building. He's talking about the assembly. <laughs> When he uses in our English the word church in that passage, he's not saying you cannot eat in the building. He said don't you engage in revelry or in frolicking in the assembly. That's what he's talking about. In other words, you assemble in order to worship God and particularly in that context to eat the Lord's Supper. And that's what they were not doing. We'd call it back in the South. They were having a hoot nanny. That's an old word that you who are under 30 have probably never heard. You might have heard nanny, but hoot is one that put them, putting them together, you probably haven't heard that before, but you have now. But the Corinthians were coming together and they were good timing. That's what he says. He says one is hungry, another is drunk. And by the way, that's an incidental point to show the nature of the wine or the juice of the grape that they were using in that gathering. You don't get drunk on grape juice. Look at what your eyes see and what your ears hear. Let the text explain itself. Am I right? Let the book stand on its own. What happens is when we become oriented to tradition, always heard it this way, and that locks in, then when God's Word says the flat opposite, we reject God's Word. Why? Because that's not the way I always heard it. The Bible is right. Making laws God didn't make. If we had needy members here, Emerson Avenue's meeting house could be used as the place to provide food for them and we would not be wrong. We would have biblical authority in doing so. Now, may not be wise, may not even be necessary. We may have some deep pockets here who'd be willing to take them to restaurants or other places. But my point is deep pockets, shallow pockets, no pockets, holy pockets. The fact is... It would not be a misuse of the meeting house to provide such things for brothers and sisters in need. And this congregation could provide. In 1 Corinthians 11, back to 22 and so forth. You know, Paul asked another question. There. He says, did you not have houses to eat and drink in? And I've heard people say, well, we couldn't feed needy believers in the building because Paul said, you've got houses to eat and to drink in. All right? But look at what Paul said. Let us learn, daily included, let us learn to hear what's there and to see what's there. Paul didn't say, do you not have houses to eat in? That's not what he said. He said, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? So if this building could not be used to provide food for needy believers, what's the water doing in it? Because he said eat and drink. Is that not what it says? What we do for so long, we've honed in on the eating. And we have overlooked completely the word drinking there. What has happened is, we fought so long and hard against the effort of some congregations to have a social gospel, an entertaining gospel, that we have sometimes failed to see the proper use of what the congregation has for the right reasons. A this building could be used to provide for our needy members and that wouldn't be the social gospel. It would be the authorized message and use of the meeting house. Another effort of making laws God didn't make. Some say you can't put up a Christmas tree during the holidays. I even know a couple of preachers that have scripture to condemn that practice. Whoopee! Yes, sir! Even have scripture to condemn putting up the so-called Christmas tree during the holidays. You know what that scripture is? 
an Old Testament text. Well, haven't we grown? We have gone back to using the Old Testament to show if something is authorized or not. Wow! We don't let the Baptists go back there for mechanical music. We don't let the Catholics go back to the Old Testament for incense. But we'll run back to it when convenient when we can't find it in the New Testament. Am I right or wrong? Dead cat on the line somewhere. I don't know how many supposedly skillful teachers and preachers I have heard reaching back to the Old Testament to show that something's right or wrong when they don't let the denominations do it. And that's one reason the denominations spit in our faces and laugh at us because of inconsistency. We tell them they can't and we do it. It's wrong no matter who does it. But here is the text that a couple of men I know use to condemn putting up a Christmas tree during the holiday season. I want you to get this. It's Jeremiah chapter 10. And by the way, when I go through this information, I'm not just citing it. I'm trying to reason and to give reasons why or why not. I'm trying to explain the points I'm making this morning. That's what makes, a, according to God's will, a sermon useful and effective. Not just citing 100,000 scriptures with no explanation, but seeking to explain one by one. Tell why a certain thing is true or opposite. Here it is, anyway. Jeremiah 10, 1 through 5 says, Hear what Yahweh says to you, people of Israel. This is what Yahweh says. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by signs in the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them. For the practices of the peoples are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with a hammer and nails so it will not totter. All right. So there are some preachers in the Lord's, among the Lord's people who run back to Jeremiah 10. And they say, if that's not a Christmas tree, there never has been one. Ooh, they deck it with silver and gold. They cut it and bring it out of the forest. And he says they shouldn't do it. Well, a couple of things to consider. How could this have been a Christmas tree when so-called Christmas was not even known at that time? <laughs> How in the world could this be talking about a Christmas tree when so-called Christmas was not even known at the time? Where is our thinking? Are we going to keep misappointing God's word and making laws because that's what we want to do? Why can't it be God's way and just book speak? Some things that sound good among us don't have a bit of fat to rest a gnat's wing on. This tree was not a so-called Christmas tree. This tree was one that was crafted and hewn out as an idol. He's talking about going and cutting down a tree and chiseling it to shape it into an idol and worshiping it. How do I know it? The very next verse says, verse 5, Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, they cannot speak. That is, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. What is the prophet saying? He is saying this. Don't go. They, they, the nations around you, they go into the forest. They cut down a tree. They hew it into a shape or a form. But this idol that they make from this tree, when they deck it out with silver and gold and beautify this idol, they have to carry this idol. It can't walk. They have to listen for this idol. It can't hear. They have to speak for this idol because it can't talk. So they've got a God that can't do any walking, won't do any talking, can't do any listening. But they worship it anyway. That's the tree he's talking about here. An idolatrous tree. But some will continue making laws God didn't make even when it comes to Christmas trees. 
Another one, another law that some have gravitated into that God didn't make is that you must have the name Church of Christ on the sign. Have a question. There is no doubt, by the way, that in our English versions that we read about churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16, but that's not the point. Could a sign beside or in front of a meeting house simply say, Christians meet here? Could it simply say, a congregation of Christ meets here, or an assembly of God meets here? Could it say that? But why do some then say it must say the church of Christ meets here? First of all, I'd like to ask, where does the book say have a sign? It's not wrong to have a sign. It is authorized generically in this way. Because you want to identify to the world who meets there. But you're not naming that who. Who is in this meeting house on the first day of the week? A congregation of Christ. Am I right? A church of Christ meets here. But that sign does not name us. It identifies us. It says we belong to Christ. We belong to the Lord. Now, someone might say, Oh, Brother Daly, I never knew you'd go that far. Now you're saying it'd be okay to put Baptist up there in Pentecostal and Methodist. No, they are absolutely positively wrong, 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 wrong. There is no divine authority for Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Nazarene, Roman Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, or any other human name. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul plainly says, You have no right to be followers of Cephas, of me, of Apollos. He says, You were immersed into Christ's name. He was crucified for you, so you are to be identified as the Lord's. Not mine, not Apollos's, and not Cephas. Human names have no authority whatsoever. And nor do we have any right to name anything that God hasn't named. We are a congregation of Christ. That's what that, that sign in the front of our meeting house that says Church of Christ. You know all that says? That we are a congregation of Christ. The word church, ecclesia. And I wish, I wish that the people would just, just think in terms of scriptural language. Congregation, assembly, group, or gathering. Immerse, submerge, dip, not baptize. When we start to think on, in terms of scriptural language and give it its proper meaning, then we can rest assured that we are right with God. But once certain phrases and words or locked into our mind, we think any other way is certainly wrong. And often they keep us from being accurate in our teaching and preaching. The New Testament gives no name in the sense of a proper name to the Lord's people. It identifies the Lord's people. Every phrase in the New Testament that uses the preposition of is identifying who the people are. A congregation of God, congregation of Christ, congregation of believers, that is consisting of believers who are the Lord's people. Another law that God didn't make, that some congregations make and will condemn congregations who don't do this. We must have two services on Sunday. I've known congregations that met one time on the first day of the week. They only met one time. Knew one in Arkansas. Knew one of the men there. He was truly God-fearing, humble, genuine servant of the cross. But that congregation met one time. And there were some who mocked them by saying, Why is it they can only meet one time and we meet twice? They have to be wrong because we've always met twice. Here's the thing. The New Testament tells us on the first day of the week. Now how many times does it say to do it? We need to be real careful that we don't start making laws that God didn't make. Each congregation is what we call autonomous. That self-governing by the word of God. And independent. That is, there's no direct organic tie that one congregation has with another except the truth and the blood of Christ. We walk in fellowship. 
if a congregation decides to meet one time for two or three hours and never come back on that same day, they have the biblical right to do it because God's word does not bind a multiplicity of gatherings on the first day of the week. I'll tell you what has happened. I know how people are. I've heard it. Well, don't you think that we need to allow the people who couldn't come on Sunday morning an opportunity to eat Lord's Supper on Sunday evening? That's not even the point of dispute. The, the point of dispute is whether or not you can bind and make a law that you have to have to ascend. All right, let me show you how this works. All right, you've got some who don't come Sunday morning, so have a Sunday evening assembly to accommodate those who weren't there. But what if you still have some who weren't there in the second assembly? Do you have a third one? Are you going to have a fourth one hoping that they will come to it? What about having a fifth, sixth, or seventh one? What about just doing it all day so they can just come in and out? <laughs> you see, we want to be right and not go beyond what the book teaches. What happens is people become accustomed to doing it and they visualize that any other way has to be wrong. That's right. I know, I've heard it. Two services on Sunday is not mandated by God. I'll tell you what is mandated, coming together on the first day of the week to break bread, Acts 20 and 7, 1 Corinthians 16 to, to lay by and store. That's mandated. Now, where, where does the text say how many times we're to do this? It doesn't say that. It simply doesn't say it. But we have two assemblies here, and I want to be as supportive as I can to as many assemblies as we have. But in doing so, I also want to remember it's not because God has made it mandatory, and I want to refuse any efforts of making laws God didn't make. We got another. Women cannot speak out or comment or ask questions in Bible class. You ever heard that law? I have. I know some women who won't say anything, and they ought to be saying a lot because they have information in the head. But for so long, they've had a doubt. Should I, should I not? Would I, could I not? The fact is, the New Testament does not forbid a woman commenting or asking a question in Bible class. It does not. 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Paul there is not forbidding a woman to ask a question or to make a comment. What Paul is forbidding is what Paul says. Verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not the one deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a sinner. So he tells, he gives his foundation and then he gives the reason why. A woman is to be in full submission, to remain quiet. Here's the reason. First, God made the man first. Second, when the woman took first, she sinned and led the man into transgression. This text emphasizes a woman's demeanor. That she is not to teach over the man. She's not to take charge of the situation. She's to remain in the place that God has assigned her, but she can make a comment and ask a question. She violates no text when she does so. Final thing. I had others. I'm going to mention one more, then uh, get towards the conclusion. Another law that's sometimes made is women may not wear pants. You ever heard that one? I have. Some of the Pentecostal groups, Church of God in Christ groups, used to hold to that. Well, I know some members of the Lord's body who have the same opinion. They say that a woman should not wear pants because Moses sure enough said in Deuteronomy 22, 5, a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man and a man shall not put on a woman's garment. Deuteronomy 22, 5. And I've had them to just really grind on that. That Moses said that a woman should not wear that which pertains to a man. She can't wear pants then. Well, here's a, a question. What did he say pants pertain to a man? There are women's pants. There are men's pants. Women's pants don't pertain to a man, do they? Men's pants don't pertain to a woman, do they? Can you picture me decked out in a pair of Thelma's pants? <laughs> Not only would they come up above my knees. <laughs> Can you picture a family decked out in a pair of my pants? 
she wouldn't come within a, a mile of them. By the time I finish wearing them for the week, they're standing straight up in the corner. But my point is this. Here we go again, going back to the Old Testament to legislate in New Testament days. Why do we go back to the Old Testament to establish law when we don't let the Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and Catholics do the same thing? When they want to run back and get mechanical music, we wear them out, so to speak. When they want to run back and get the Sabbath day, we wear them out, so to speak. When they want to run back and get incense burning, we tan their hides. And yet we do the same thing. God's Son, Jesus, calls that hypocrisy. Whatever Deuteronomy 22, 5 talked, it's not talking to us anyway. We're not Israelites. The law of Moses wasn't given to us. Well, what is he talking about in Deuteronomy 22, 5? That a man shouldn't be wearing women's clothes, that a woman shouldn't be wearing men's clothes. Transvestism is that which God has always condemned. If you are a man, be a man. You're a woman, be a woman. Don't be crisscrossing, cross-dressing, and all of that sinful foolishness. Why are we getting quiet? Come on, men. Our real men, at least. <laughs> but that's the point of Deuteronomy 22.5. Now, but somebody says, but I still know what Deuteronomy 22.5 says, Brother Ron. Do you really? Let's walk on down to verse 9 in the same context. Do not plant two kinds of seed in your vineyard. Well, I have about, about eight Concord grapevines. And I put out some tomatoes right along the way. Had some squash and corn. Put out some peppers a couple of years ago. And for some reason, those habaneros made things that were close around them smoking hot. Had to get, forget habaneros this year. But here it is. Do not plant two kinds of seed in your vineyard. Does this legislation apply? Go on down to the next verse. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Does that legislation apply today? Go down to the next verse. Do not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together. Looks like when summer comes, we better go back to wearing pure polyester. He says right here, do you not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together? The point is, this is not New Testament legislation. This is Old Testament legislation. And the people who appeal to verse 5, saying that a woman cannot wear pants, are not consistent. They need to read the next several verses and then see if they're following it. Even if they are, it doesn't apply to them. Ways, the dangers of making laws for God. And I'll be through pretty quickly. Number one, when you start making laws God didn't make and imposing them on other people, you discourage everybody around you. Telling them, you can't do this, can't do that, don't do this, don't do that. You're saying if you do, you're saying if you don't. And you're not giving them reasons why. You're not pointing them to any scripture. It's just your own law that you've made in lieu of the law of God. That's not fair. That's not right. We should be able to cite Scripture and to explain the Scriptures in a way that they harmonize and not put them at odds with one another. Sometimes people get so discouraged from what lawmakers are doing that they just give up. Just give up. As a man, you can't do anything around these folks. If you breathe, you're sinning. If you hold it, you're sinning because you're going to commit suicide if you don't breathe. <laughs> Another danger of making laws for God is it is an impeachment of God's wisdom. You call God's wisdom in to question and you put it on trial. God knows better than all of us combined and all of humanity combined what his will is and ought to be. We have no right whatsoever to impeach the wisdom of God. And we do that when we make laws that God did not make. It's never right to do it. God's wisdom is perfect. Next, 
This is the thing that perhaps should rank near the top. When we make laws God didn't make, we do it to the loss of our souls. Because nobody can approach God to make a law he didn't make and to question God's wisdom and impeach God's knowledge and get by with it. We should resist every, at every turn and opportunity any effort of anyone to make laws God didn't make. Final point. Ways to avoid making laws for God. First, learn to ask what says the Scriptures. Romans 4 verse 3. When Paul's talking about the means by which uh, Abraham was justified, Paul asked this question. He says, what says the Scripture? That's the question, not what says mama, daddy, brother, sister, preacher, elder, deacon, husband, wife, and everybody else. What says the scripture? And stick in there and hang with it when you find it. That'll help a person not make laws God didn't make. What says the scriptures? Next, stop where the scriptures stop. 1 Peter 4, 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the very word of God. We all need to learn this, brothers and sisters, and I do too. We all do. Learn to stop right where Scripture stops and hold your horses right there and do not drop the rein. You know what we're so prone to do? We'll see what God's Word says. Then we're going to start second. But it could be if, or it might be, could be, ought to be. Oh, what if? <laughs> Sound familiar? Or, or could it be that? Or, or who knows, maybe you're dabbling and dipping into something you don't have a right to dabble and dip. Maybe, could be, might be. If God hasn't said it, shut up! If God has not spoken, hush! I don't care who you are, black, white, red, yellow, Daly, Goodwin, Maxwell, Jared, Brown. If God hasn't spoken, hush! Shut up! Keep quiet! The only thing we can know about God's will is what God has revealed. If He hasn't revealed it, keep your maybes, ought to be, might be, could be, what if. Keep them out. Final. We can avoid making laws God didn't make by not approaching the Scriptures with an agenda-oriented motivation. So many people turn to the text to prove something that they want to prove. And so if the only way they can prove it is to make a law for God, that's what they're going to do. Now, this does not mean, I am not saying that we should not prove our practice and doctrine by the Word. That's not it. I'm talking about people who approach Scripture with an agenda in mind. In other words, let me just illustrate this. Oh, I never have cared much for that low-down scoundrel. I'm going to go to the Bible and find at least one verse that shows him to be wrong and me to be right if I have to pervert it. That no good for nothing maggot. I get so tired of him saying I'm wrong. Uh, honey, help me find a verse somewhere. Hand me the concordance. If I have to pervert one, I'll do it to shut him up or to shut her up. God won't let that happen because Scripture cannot be broken, John 10, 34 and 35. <laughs> scripture can break us. We can't break Scripture. It'll crush us every time. Our approach when we go to the Bible should be this. Lord, speak. Your servant is willing to listen. Lord, speak. Tell me, show me the word of truth. He shows us as we turn to the pages and read what is written on them. We shouldn't have a motive, an agenda of wanting to crush someone or, or so determined that we're so full of pride that we won't admit that we're wrong that what we're going to do is take a text and just completely unwrap it and distort it and make it appear to say something that it doesn't say. Judgment Day is going to deal with people like that, even if it's me. Thank you for your time and attention. I know that I had a lot to say, but I think, as was stated a couple of weeks ago, the time had come to present this because we, not you, we need to hear this.
We need to know this. And I thank God for giving us the time and the opportunity to listen to the things that have been presented. If you, if you have found me to be in error on one or more points, show me, tell me. If you're right, I'll make public correction. And I'm serious, genuinely serious. But now you be willing to do the same thing. Same thing. Same thing. God is right. If you're not a Christian, you need to believe that Jesus Christ the Son, is the Son of the living God. You need to repent, reform your lives, turn around, and change. You need to acknowledge before people that Jesus is Lord and Messiah. And then you must be immersed into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit so that all of your past sins may be forgiven. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. There's no need to continue procrastinating, waiting, and delaying. The need is to come walking and obeying and have the hope of a heavenly home. You may do so now as we stand in sin.